Good morning and welcome. We are absolutely delighted that you have chosen to take some time today to worship with the family of God here at ECOG, Enola First Church of God. Again, welcome. If you would like a bulletin for this particular service, you can simply go to our website, www.enolacog.com. And when you're there, click on the button that says Bulletin for August 30, and uh, you can download that into your device or print it out if you so desire. Now on that bulletin, we have several announcements on the last page, and this time I'd like to share some of those with you so that you can be informed of what's happening here in our church family. Today at 9 and 9.30 a.m., our preschool and elementary Sunday school lessons respectively premiere. They will be on Facebook Live. If you don't have Facebook or if you're watching after that particular time period, no problem, go to this YouTube channel that's uh, Sunshine TV and you can find those videos there. Watch them with those kids that may be in your care and I'll dare you to do this. Download the papers that we have as well under the children's activity sheets and have Sunday school with those young people. They'll be blessed and so will you. Tell folks that may be coming here to the sanctuary for today's 1045 a.m. service that if they're not comfortable coming into the sanctuary, there are other designated areas in the building that they may sit for some distancing and privacy, or they can remain in their cars or go in the pavilion or find another shady spot on the property and listen to this service from 89.9 FM on a radio. Other announcements we have. Tonight at 6.15 p.m., our praise team will be practicing. Tuesday at 6 p.m., our technology team meets, and at 6.30 p.m. on Tuesday, our magnifiers team will be meeting. Wednesday, our youth group will be at the church, most likely in the pavilion, or if the weather is inclement, they'll be in the fellowship hall. So let the youth know that youth meetings face-to-face -face are resuming beginning this Wednesday. Saturday, the men's ministry will be having their breakfast in the fellowship hall at 8 a.m. And next Sunday will be a regular Sunday where we will have our online worship service available all day long. Those uh, preschool and elementary Sunday school lessons on Facebook and on YouTube. And we'll have the 1045 a.m. service here in the sanctuary. Other things that are coming up this fall to be aware of on Wednesday, September 9th, we will resume adult Bible study in the lower level in room four. That will also, if all goes well, be broadcast on Facebook Live so that if you're not comfortable coming to Bible study, you may be able to watch that uh, where you are. Also, kids worship and nursery will resume Sunday, September 13th. Not next Sunday, but September 13th. That will be at the 1045 a.m. worship service See the Sunshine News that also is available for September on our website. All those details are there and you should have or will be receiving a letter if you're on our mailing list from the church talking about all these changes coming this fall. Also on September 13th, we are planning to start scheduling our Sunday evening prayer services again. Uh, they will be at 7 p.m. in the sanctuary. So please make note of those things. One more thing that does not appear in the bulletin, but it's very important, and that is uh, regarding Hurricane Laura. As you know, many people down south there on the Texas-Louisiana border on the Gulf are affected by this in a disastrous way. And if you feel led to help with, uh, in any way with this particular relief that's going on regarding Hurricane Laura, we invite you to consider uh, contributing to the needs of Samaritan's Purse or Mennonite Disaster Service, or if you would like to go in person and to help out, if you're a hands-on person, one organization that we have been partnering with financially, but they would be happy for us to join with them in person, is Eight Days of Hope. Go to our website, www.enolacog.com, and you can find out ways that you can be a blessing to others that are dealing with this terrible, terrible tragedy of Hurricane Laura. I believe those are all the announcements that we have for this morning, so at this time we're going to begin our service by listening to the prelude.
This morning's call to worship comes to us from Psalm 150. We invite you now to give your attention to the reading of God's word. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Will you pray with me? God, as we gather together as your people today, we pray today that we would recognize what a blessing it is to be the people of God. Father, as your people, we pray that we would praise you as our Heavenly Father with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength this day. May this service truly be yours. May it be for you and unto you. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you join me now in singing How Great Thou Art?
Today's offering moment comes to us from Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 2, where the Apostle Paul says, And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. We're so grateful for the opportunity that we have to worship God in this way by being generous to others and to giving to his work. We encourage you to continue to be generous to others as God may lead you. We want to thank you for your generosity. And we also want to thank those of you who continue to support this ministry faithfully by sending in your checks, your offering envelopes, by dropping them off or by setting up your uh, bank to do that for you. It's a blessed thing to give. It's a blessed thing to know that as we give to the Lord's work, lives are changed. Let's take this opportunity now to pray over our gifts, tithes, and offerings and our acts of generosity. Will you pray with me now? God, we thank you that you are a generous God. We know that every good and perfect gift comes down from you, the Father of lights. So Lord, it's an honor for us today to send some of that back your way, whether it is through the giving of the tithes and offerings that we give to you, whether it's being generous to someone who's in need of a blessing, or even stepping out even further on a limb and giving of ourselves or our time or our treasures to those affected in a disaster like Hurricane Laura. Lord, for all of these gifts that we are sending to the work of your kingdom, we pray that you would bless them. We pray that you would use them. We pray, Lord, that frankly you'd multiply them so that many people in many places would be blessed with the gospel. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you join me now in singing, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. So let's do that together now. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Will you pray with me? God, we are grateful today, grateful that we, as your people, serve such a great and mighty God. God, as we think of your greatness and then we look at ourselves, we realize that we in no wise match up. In fact, Father, many times we don't act like your people. We act like a rebellious people. 
that does not want to follow your will or your way. So, Lord, for all of those times in this past week that we have done exactly that, where we've rebelled, we've disobeyed, we've thought that our way is much superior to yours, we want to ask for your forgiveness. At this time, let us silently acknowledge our sins and confess them to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your cleansing wave of forgiveness. We thank you so much, Heavenly Father, that we can trust in those words of assurance of pardon in your word, that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Thank you for this special gift. Thank you for your forgiveness, Lord. Heavenly Father, as we continue in prayer today, we're mindful of the blessings that you do send to us as a good, good Father. And we thank you, Father, for these things, the common graces of the air that we breathe, the water we have to drink, the meals that we share with our families and friends, for the opportunity that we have to be a part of a support system of a church family. We thank you for our homes. We thank you for it all, Lord. And may we never take these things for granted or forget that it is by your grace that we have them. We thank you for the special graces that you send our way. For each time, Father, you sent your Holy Spirit to say to us, Ah, uh -uh, not that way. Go this way. You've held our tongues from saying something that we would regret. You sent your angels to protect us if we may have been just about in harm's way. You've done so many other things, Lord, that we're not aware of. But we walk by faith and not by sight. We know by faith that you have been there with us each step of the way, and we're grateful to you. Lord, we do pray for this nation and this world in which we live, particularly as much as being kicked off for the presidential election in this nation. Father, we pray for your will to be done and that the people that you would want to have in office, whether it is the presidential office or other offices in this land, down to the lowest office, locally speaking, Father, we just pray that your will would be done. That's what we ask for. Lord, we pray for calm in the streets of our nation. Certainly, Father, we pray for those that are grieving the tragedies that have happened, in particular the shooting that happened of the young man in Wisconsin. Father, even though this is so painful for so many people, may we have the attitude of that victim's mother who is encouraging us to pray. And so we do that, Lord. We do pray. And we pray, Father, that you will take all of these bad things that are happening and that you will make something good come out of that. Lord, I pray for revival. I pray for people realizing that there is a need for us to come together and to bless one another. And may that start with your church being your ambassadors, your hands, your voice to others in this world, Lord, showing your love to others. Father, we do pray today for those things in this world that are not right, that you would right them. We pray, Lord, that the things that this world loves that you despise and the things that you despise in this or that you love in this world despises, that, Father, there could be a reversal, that this world would get on board with what you're doing. And that only comes through your Holy Spirit coming and doing a work in the lives of many people. Lord, on that note, we would pray for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit. And even now, we pray that you would reach down and that you would speak to those who do not know you, that soon and even very soon, they would come to know Jesus as their Savior and Lord. At this time, let's lift to the Lord the names of people who need Jesus as their Savior and Lord, that they would surrender their lives totally and completely to him. Thank you, Lord, for touching the lives of those individuals by speaking words to them through your Holy Spirit. We would like to see a harvest, many souls coming to know Jesus. Lord, for your people today that are watching or gathering in various places, we pray for those that are hurting, those with emotional and physical pains, for those, Father, that perhaps are growing weary or apathetic or doubtful in their faith that you would fan the flame of the Holy Spirit in them once again. We pray for those that need decisions to be made that you would give them wisdom. We pray for others, Lord, that perhaps 
they have financial needs or other needs that we're not even thinking about, that, Lord, you would meet them according to your will and your way. And help us to trust, Lord, when you answer us. We love it when you say yes. We don't like it when you say no. And sometimes we become impatient when you say wait, but may we understand that your timing and your will is perfect. Now, Lord, we just want to pray for your church everywhere, that your church would shine for Jesus. We thank you that the gates of hell are not going to prevail against your church, no matter how bad things may look in this world. May your kingdom come and your will be done. Help us locally here in this church to serve as your lighthouse, guiding people to salvation and preparing people to face the storms of life. And now we would ask for a blessing that your word to us would be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, that your word would guide us and show us the way that you would have us to be to honor and glorify you. And we ask all these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. It was 21 days ago from this very pulpit at the 1045 a.m. sanctuary service that Pastor Craig Dubinsky reminded us about a man who is faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. Look up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's, you know who it is. Yes, Superman. Oh, yeah. For many, many years, up until this very present time, Superman has been a man that little boys all over America have wanted to be like. They've wanted to imitate him and be just like him. Well, let me tell you about something that happened 30 years ago from this very month. I did my very first full week as a camp counselor, serving as a counselor for seven boys at Camp Uligua, a Christian camp and retreat center that we participate with in the churches of God. And of those seven boys that were in my room, there was one who had a hero that he wanted to imitate. And let me tell you, oh, did he imitate this so-called hero. And let me also tell you that I do not consider this hero to be a real hero. The hero was definitely not Superman, nor was it Batman or Spider-Man or Aquaman or any of those other cartoon superheroes you can think of. Rather, and unfortunately for me, this kid's hero was none other than, get this, Bart Simpson. Man, was that a tough week. Oh my, that kid acted like emulated, imitated, and was just like, in all of his mannerisms, Bart Simpson for seven long, hot August days, 30 years ago. Wow, don't know how I did it. God gave me strength, I guess. Well, today we come to the third of our Dear John letters, the book of Third John. And in this letter, John is specifically addressing a church leader who is a very good friend to his. These guys, they were buds. And he is telling this friend um, about the kind of people that we as Christians, well, that he in particular, should imitate. And, and he mentions two guys that he and his friend both personally must have known. One was a positive role model. I guess you could say like a Superman. But the other guy, he was bad news, just like Bart Simpson. Someone you don't want to make as your role model. Now, do you want to guess which one John is encouraging his friend to be like, to model after, and to imitate? You got it. The good guy, the godly man. By the way, both of these guys' names that John is asking his friend to imitate, their names begin with the letter D. Thus, we have demand to be and demand not to be. So what can we glean from the advice in this letter to help us in our walk with God? Let's take a look. Let's read the letter now. The book of 3 John, chapter 1, the only chapter, verses 1 to 15, all the verses, we're reading the whole book again, like we did in the second letter. 3 John, chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. John writes, 
the elder to the beloved Gaius, who I love in the truth. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. For I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. For they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. I had much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends, each by name. And there ends the third letter. Let's begin by introducing once again John, and now this friend of his in verses 1 to 3. In verse 1, the letter writer is, of course, John the Apostle. And again, like in his second letter, he refers to himself simply as the elder. Is he an apostle? Yeah, sure he is. But he's doing away with the formalities again as he talks with his friend. It's me, the elder. Now we move on in verse 1 and then verses 2, 3, and 4. We see the letter recipient is John's friend, a church leader and a fine man named Gaius. How do you like that name? You know, that name sounds like something that may be, well, how a redneck would refer to gasoline, doesn't it? Go fill the lawnmower up with some Gaius. Isn't that what that sounds like? Never mind. Anyway, John loves this man, Gaius, if you will, as a brother in the Lord. And like John, he is a man who is in the truth. He's a really good guy. And in verse 2, John can't help but wish him well in his health. And he also prays for him spiritually that his soul, that it will go well with his soul, that his soul will prosper. And verse 3, John gives some good reasons why he rejoices in a friend like Gaius. Apparently, there were some co-laborers of John, either traveling teachers or evangelists, that Gaius also knew and that he was working with. And word got back to John about how well Gaius was treating these men in their ministry, how he was walking in the truth. And verse 4, John says this greatly warms his heart. Because nothing brings him more joy than when one of his children, that is one of his spiritual children, one of the people that he discipled and had a hand in their faith formation, when they're walking in the truth, oh, that charges him up. So this is a really, really good friend of the Apostle John's. He's probably the kind of friend that Michael W. Smith sung about back in his 1984 iconic song, Friends are Friends Forever, If the Lord is Lord of Them. Let's move on now. Verses 5 through 8. Let's learn a lesson from John's friend and from these co-laborers that John speaks about. In verse 5, John gives Gaius the equivalent of a big thumbs up, a big encouragement for how he's treated these co-laborers, these evangelists or traveling teachers, whoever they were, because to Gaius, they were strangers. But in verse 6, John testifies that these guys, these strangers to Gaius, well, he treated them very well. And therefore, John says, you keep it up. You will do well to send them on their way in a worthy manner. Keep up the good work. 
And speaking of these teachers, these evangelists, these co-laborers of John in verse 7, John says that they went out accepting nothing from the Gentiles. They accepted help only from other Christians because if they accepted help from non-Christians, the Gentiles that is, some may question their motives. You see, in the ancient Roman Empire, there were these shady guys that go, would go around peddling their gods, so to speak, to anyone who would hear them just so that they could make a quick buck. These guys didn't want to do that because they did not want to look shady and bring reproach on the gospel. Good for them. And in verse 8, this is why John is telling Gaius that we really, really, really need to support people like this who are walking in the truth and integrity and in are teaching God's word the right way. In the other letters, you heard all about those bad guys, those false prophets out there. Man, when you get some people out there really doing God's work and are good people, we need to encourage them. We need to encourage one another. So what can we learn? We're talking about some good people in this letter all around. We're done dealing with those false teachers, mostly, that we saw in the other letters. We're talking about some good people here. And the example that Gaius has displayed here is a good model for us to follow today. We need to support good people who are doing God's work with integrity. And I would say this, if there's ever a time where God's people need to come together and support one another, now is that time. I am convinced there is a very bad trend that has been happening for years in our society regarding human support systems and people helping and supporting one another, even in the church. Back in 1996, a man named Robert Putnam wrote a book, and get this, <laughs> the name of the book is Bowling Alone. <laughs> sounds like that book may be a good cure for insomnia. But actually, it sounds kind of interesting. In this book, Mr. Putnam shared what he discovered in doing some research in how community life has been affected in America for the last 25 years. Now, being that this was written in 1996, he's going from the early 70s up there to the mid 90s. So as he studied the different social trends and human interaction from the early 70s to the mid 90s, this is what he found. Attending club meetings in the United States, down 58%. Listen to this one. Families having dinner together, down 33%. People just having friends over to hang out or chill out, down 45% in that time period. And by the way, he entitled the book Bowling Alone because he also found that from 1980 to 1993, bowling in leagues dropped, declined by 40%, while the number of individual bowlers rose by 10%. Thus, more and more people are bowling alone and doing a lot of other things alone. Now, let me ask you this. Since the mid-1990s, when this guy wrote this book, do you think that these trends have reversed and have improved and that people are now supporting each other more and more? No way. And I would add that in the last five months, where we are being encouraged to stay inside and stay away from each other so you don't catch coronavirus, that has to be affecting human interaction in a negative way. In fact, we know it is. We know it is. We as Christians need to buck that trend. We need to support one another, especially those who are doing the work of the gospel. It's the right thing to do. That's John talking to Gaius, talking about what he was like and what these co-laborers are like. Now, John's going to give some advice to his dear friend in verses 9 through 12. And this is the heart of the message today. Let's look at this advice that John gives to his friend. By the way, shouldn't be surprised that he's given his friend advice. Friends have always given one another advice you may recall, and some of you may even remember the origins of the phrase from many, many, many years ago, friends don't let friends drive drunk. That came out. And then after that, a bunch of other similar ones came out. 
Like friends, don't let friends skip sunscreen. That's almost a tongue twister. Put your sunscreen on. And other ones came up. My all-time favorite one is friends don't let friends eat lima beans. Okay, I'm kidding. I made that one up. But you get the point. That's what we do when we have a close relationship with someone. We can give them advice. And in fact, if it's a good friend who's a good godly person, they're going to receive that advice. Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 9 says, Give instruction to a wise man and he will be wiser. Teach a righteous man and he will increase in learning. Now on the other hand, if you have someone not like that, we're warned one verse before that in Proverbs 9, 8, the beginning says, Do not reprove a scoffer or he will hate you. And that's true. But if you do have a good godly person that you have a strong relationship with, you can encourage them. You can give them advice and they're going to receive them. So what's the advice that John has for his dear friend Gaius? It's in verse 11. Verse 11. So we're looking at verses 9 through 12, but we're going to start with verse 11. Here's the advice. He says, Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Now for clarification, I think what John is specifically saying is, don't imitate evil people, but imitate good people. Now, why do I think that he's referring more specifically to people here? Well, because he continues in verse 11 by saying, whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Talking about people there. On a side note, John is obviously not saying that good works make someone a child of God. Rather, that when a godly person is doing good, that good stuff he or she is doing is the fruit of their godliness, of who they are, how God has changed them. On the other hand, the person who is doing evil as a lifestyle continuously, that person has obviously not been changed by God. And if you notice very carefully, before verse 11, John mentions the name of a person not to imitate. He's the bad guy, if you will. And after verse 11, John mentions the name of a person that he wants definitely for Gaius to imitate. He's a good guy. And again, both of these guys, their names just happen to begin with the letter D. That's why we have demand to be and demand not to be. So let's go to verse 12 and talk about demand to be. Who is he? What's his name? His name is Demetrius. Now, what did he do? Well, we don't know a lot about him other than, yeah, he's a good guy. He received a good testimony from everyone. That's how we know. Everybody was talking well about this fellow. And John says that even if truth itself could speak and testify, if truth could somehow be personified into a person, truth would speak well about Demetrius. And even John can add his own testimony into the mix and say, this Demetrius fellow, he's a good guy. He's the kind of guy that you want to imitate. Again, what specifically did he do? We don't know, but we definitely know that Demetrius is demand to be. That's who you want to imitate. Now, Backing up before verse 11 to verses 9 and 10, we get to meet D-man not to be. His name is Diotrephes. What's the deal with this guy? What did he do? Well, for all of the good that we have no idea what Demetrius did, we know an awful lot about the bad that Diotrephes did. We know the tricks he pulled. Lots of stuff. Ay, 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 ay. Look at it. In verse 9, first of all, he liked putting himself first, lording his authority over others. You know what that is? That's selfish pride. Jesus warned about this in Matthew 20, 24 to 25, where he says, You know, he told his disciples, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. That's 
the attitude of a believer. Diotrephes, whether or not he was a believer, I don't know, but he didn't have the right attitude. This guy needed some work. Peter also told the shepherds, those elders that were shepherding the flock in his first letter that he was referring to, he says, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. By the way, I didn't mention that's in 1 Peter chapter 5, first couple of verses there. So that's one problem with this Diotrephes. He loved exercising his pride in a way that he lorded it over others. Also in verse 9, he did not acknowledge the authority of John and his co-laborers. Surprise, surprise. The guy must have been full of, pr of pride. I'm not going to recognize your authority. I want to be the big shot. In verse 10 says, John says, when he saw Diotrephes, when he came at least to be with the people there, he was going to talk about this to confront the situation because Diotrephes was gossiping. He was talking wicked nonsense, stirring things up against John and those good co-laborers. Also in verse 10, he refused to welcome those co-laborers, those gospel teachers and evangelists that Demetrius was gracious to and that Gaius was gracious to. I believe Demetrius probably was because they spoke well of him. We know Gaius was. Diotrephes, he wouldn't do that. Also in verse 10, if other people did try to welcome these teachers, these good people, Diotrephes tried to make him stop it. And finally, in verse 10, if someone insisted on being good and welcoming these co-laborers in the gospel John is speaking on, Diotrephes would work his hardest to get them kicked out of the church. This guy was a real humdinger of a fellow. And so John was telling his friend, and by extension he's telling us, you don't want to be like that guy. Yep, Diotrephes is definitely D-man not to be. Well, let's mention John's goodbye here in verses 13 to 15. John closes this letter to his good friend by saying that he has more to say, but he'd rather talk to him face to face. So then he closes the letter with nice words, with kind words, I should say, words of peace to his dear friend. So as we think of all these things in this third letter, what do we do with it? Well, hopefully we as a church family, we can recognize that we are friends through our common faith in Jesus. And so we should want to support one another and support others that like us are in the gospel work, whether it is in some kind of way as a teacher in an official capacity, or even just as you serve God in your home and in your neighborhood where you are. We all need to support one another. We need to do that. As society continues to be less and less connected and more and more distant, we need to encourage and support one another. We need one another. Like the writer of Hebrews said, let us consider how to stir one another on to love and good deeds. And as friends, let's be willing to remind one another to imitate good and not to imitate evil. And we have some good examples right here in this letter, who to imitate and who not to imitate. D-man to be and D-man not to be. Let's continue being the men and women that God has made us to be through Jesus. And let's continue to work out our calling, striving to be the kinds of people that he would have us to be, not imitating the evil, but imitating the good, serving as the servants that God has called us to be. Amen and amen. Would you join me now in singing, Lord, speak to me.
we invite you now to receive the benediction. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the opportunity of worship today. And Lord, even though through this venue we are distanced from one another, and in this particular time in our history as a nation, we are compelled to be distanced from one another. Father, I pray that that distance that we now are experiencing, that it will make our hearts grow fonder to encourage and to bless one another in your name. May we encourage one another on to good deeds, and may we be reminded to remind one another who you have called us to be and who you do not want us to be like at all. Bless us now as we go forth to serve you. Help us to serve you with all of our heart, soul, minds, and strength. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. This concludes our worship service here online for Sunday, August 30th, 2020. Thank you so much for joining us. May the Lord bless you.